Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I am thrilled to be able to welcome back Rod Bray, Linda Grokey, Paul Sims, and Guillaume Lapierre. And I had to pronounce that, or I had to practice again, Guillaume, that just doesn't roll off my tongue, unfortunately. Um, so yes, I'm uh, very excited to have another one of our sessions of Ask Me Anything, which opens the opportunity for your uh, questions to come in from everybody in attendance as well as some of the questions that some of you sent in in advance. Um, before we get into questions for our expert panelists, is there anything that uh, you would like to offer up to the attendees? Okay, well then we'll move right in to our first question. Um, this one comes from Sarah and she asks, how do you convince leadership to not focus on the so-called vanity metrics and what you called uh, good, which is outcomes? Well, that's difficult. I mean, there's no easy answer here. Um, I think, uh, as with almost everything, the proof is in the pudding that as we'll see, vanity metrics are precisely that. They're there to make people feel good, but they don't actually um, deliver on anything. If we start to turn our attention instead to outcomes and really press the point about delivering true value, if you believe at all in the Pareto principle, and most, most people do when pressed to, then I think they start to come to understand that the real issue here is how do we get to market faster? How do we deliver things better? Uh, all the rest of the stuff is just, well, they're, they're like the idiot gauges on our car, right? I mean, they're there, they, do, they can speak to specific little problems, but really the more important thing is, is this thing, is this car starting? Are we able to start delivering value? And, uh, and to drive home that point, uh, you know, there's, there's been a great little adage that's been floating around just lately, and I love that, the whole idea that, um, you know, trying to find the, the minimum business increment that we can deliver uh, is not an excuse to deliver less. It's, an ex it's a, a reason to deliver more, right? right. So I'm yeah. quoting a great there, Al Shalloway. And uh, so I've got to give him credit on that. That is a great quote. And so we got to be focused on that. I think this requires those difficult conversations to speak about that rather than um, relying on the idiot lights, so to speak, on your dashboard, that that's somehow going to give you what it is you're expecting. It's, it's more, it requires so much more than that. I, I agree with turning the conversation to value. And I think the other thing that's important to recognize is stakeholder satisfaction. Are we delighting our stakeholders? So if we're not, we have to ask the question, why not? And how can we do better? And so net promoter score is a very easy way to measure stakeholder satisfaction. And it's a one question. Um, answer that uh, can give you some very valuable information about how they're feeling. And the other question I like to ask them is if you could make one change to improve what we have delivered to you, what would that be? Yeah, and uh, as, as Rod said, sometimes that, you know, that those are the tough questions you have to ask. And uh, sometimes you also need to maybe make it a little more lighthearted. I sometimes open with a, one of the Dilbert cartoons that shows we're going to change your compensation plan to all the development team members for how many defects you fix. So the next slide is, or the next picture is the guy saying, I'm gonna go write enough code to buy a new Porsche. <laughs> right? you know, he's just gonna write enough defects to be able to do that. Um, so yeah, that's um, uh, something that is uh, um, always a, a challenging conversation. So we have our next question from Carlos. He says, how can I determine maturity agile level of the organization? So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start off and then ask for those of you, the rest of the panelists to join in. So I, there's a few ways to do this. And again, I'm gonna tie this back into kind of what we talked about in our what, you know, what good really looks like. As far as the maturity level, are we talking about the adoption maturity level, like how good we're doing with respect to adopting discipline agile or adopting whatever agile framework 
uh, an organization might be using. And again, we kind of touched on this before that there is some amount of importance that should be put there because it is expensive to go through these organizational transformations. You're paying for training and you're paying for coaching and you're paying you know, for a number of things, but that is not what's really important, right? Again, focusing back on our outcomes and focusing on how are we, we moving towards more of a, of a higher confidence level that what we are producing or what the teams are producing is gonna be valuable once we release that into our production environment for our customers, our users to actually be doing something with it. That's, that's from a maturity perspective where we should be focusing on. And a lot of times when we do assessments of, of organizations and sort of the agility health check, that's where we drive things towards. That's so well said, uh, Joshua. I, while you're speaking, I'm thinking in terms of we could be checking all the boxes in regards to the ceremonies uh, of whatever framework we've adopted, whether it's Scrum or Safe or Lean Kanban or whatever it is. We're doing all the right things. But if we still can't deliver value to our customer base inside of a year and they would like it to happen inside of a year, then we're not very mature in terms of our ag agility. And if we're unable to be resilient to changes in the market, that is to be able to uh, change course as we need to, that's the true definition of agility, right? Is to be able to be resilient to change. And if we're not able to do that, you know, we there's lots of little trial questions. We almost think of them as litmus tests. You know, we all remember litmus tests in our high school chemistry. And so we do some, one of those sorts of things. If, if, if for the sake of argument, uh, the change in requirements comes and it's six months before we could do anything about it, we're not very agile. Mm -hmm. I was going to say as well, just on that, that you can have the practices in place. So you can be doing all the, the agile practices that on the surface may look like you're, you know, agile and to some degree you are, but have you got the principles there as well? Like, is that mindset really there? Is there a cultural mindset that's working in an agile way? So, you know, on the surface, you can be doing all the right things, but you do need that, that leadership, that, that cultural mindset to be of agile as well and i think for me that would that would really suggest that you're quite mature with agile and also the technology which is a huge investment when it comes to any organization um transitioning to an agile way of working and i think that's probably the biggest area like is there is there the is the investment there are people putting the money behind the technology to keep up with what agile can do when you really get going I like your point, Linda. I think it's important that the leaders in the organization show that they're willing to ad adopt an agile way of working as well. It's not just at the team level. Right. And if I can bounce on that, I, I think I think uh, the organization uh, leaders need to 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 allow that they need to provide the safe environment and support to make that happen, and 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 maybe lower a little bit their expectations. Uh, from their team uh, uh, outcomes in the short terms because they know that that it's going to be a learning curve uh, around that and and that all together needs to to work uh, uh, towards a, a better ways of working together as a team and not as a series of individual doing uh, work together yeah yeah uh, Ahmad asks when we talk about choosing your way of working with people that do not know it or not open to knowing that their scrum is not enough, they become defensive and believe Agile Manifesto is a sacred doctrine that cannot be or should not be tempered with. Uh, and as I'm, I, and Ahmad, if you, um, if you want to add to that, uh, I don't see that that's a question, but it's a very good statement. Mm -hmm. uh, when we but I don't think that there's anything in the manifesto that says we shouldn't be pragmatic, that um, we shouldn't start where we are and seek to improve. And remember, discipline agile is goal driven. That's what distinguishes it. Uh, it is not prescriptive like Scrum. Uh, you probably have to just choose your words carefully when you present it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I like to say to the teams, you know, if you focus on these goals, we believe that you will be more successful. Yeah, yeah. And uh, also with teams that are, are doing, uh, a, a, you know, delivering good value using a Scrum approach, 
um, oftentimes just asking them some of the things that they do, they'll be doing things that are beyond what is in the Scrum Guide. And so that also yeah. just opens the yeah. discussion to say, well, I mean, that's exactly what we're doing with Discipline Agile. We're, we're providing um, options for other things that, that you'll find value with. And if you don't, stop, stop doing them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Try something else. Yeah. I mean, I like Scrum. I do. But in its, where I am today, it's not enough. Like you, you need more, you need a little bit more behind it, I would say. And Scrum doesn't, in my opinion, allow for some more of the, um, the higher level, like the budget control, the governance. It, it, it's, it's fantastic for getting a team up and running, the wheel spinning and all that good stuff. But I just feel like um, sometimes Scrum, it, it stops and ends there and there's more behind, there's more needed sometimes behind it at an enterprise level anyway, and especially if you're scaling agile. Yeah, it's so well said, Linda. That's the whole systems thinking, right? That Scrum, we know Scrum is very focused in on yeah. development, right? Yeah. And we've already exactly. got this list of stuff to do, and we've got to get it all done, and what are some really great ways to attack it? Where did this list of things to do come from? Right, did it exactly. spring out of the forehead of Zeus <laughs> fully formed? Right? I mean, no, not at all. That in fact, uh, there is a whole portfolio management and an intake process and all the rest of that, and some Scrum is silent on it. Other frameworks, like SAFE, have, are very prescriptive and tell you about some stuff to do. And then I'm gonna come back around to what Paul's comment was, was DA gives you this toolkit of things to work in your context, including uh, how do you deal with the portfolio of projects coming down? You know, like, we've yeah. probably all had experiences of working on teams where they're doing a lot of the scrum things just perfect, but they're being overwhelmed yeah. by the work being pushed down on them. And yeah. so, uh, you know, Eli Goldratt said that, uh, you know, sometimes just working on smaller things more frequently can bring a system back into control, right? So that's, yeah. that's the kind of stuff we want to be able to do. And, and he has some answers to that. And for people getting getting solution pre-built solution you know because they need they know already what to do because it's been thinked uh, before them and when it comes to professional uh, how, how can we really support them in in truly in truly uh, uh, adding their their own talent their own twist in there to to make it great to make it awesome and and not just uh, try to execute some commands that they receive because uh, some of the people tried to to uh, pre pre write all in pseudo code in in some documents for them and and try to dumb them away because they're developers and eh, well that's that's where that's where I think DAs just uh, uh, helps us to to, yeah. to see the whole flow and the whole flow. Exactly. Of yeah, exactly. Like Scrum is almost the middle bit, and DA is the beginning the middle and the end and scrum kind of fits right in there which is great but you do need the beginning and the end right um, anyway so anitra asks as an agile coach i have been working with a few teams within my organization using the da toolkit we've seen some great success with adoption and now our enterprise pmo uh, which is a legacy heavy waterfall is interested in learning more about how we can use DA throughout the PMO. Where's a good place to start outside of starting with education on Discipline Agile? That's why I think Rod, Rod uh, and Paul talked about it a little earlier. Since DA is a lot of goal driven, uh, for people that are more into a waterfall mindset, what is what is uh, some of the goals of the waterfall? You know, you need to decide: uh, do we have sufficient budgeting? Do we have uh, a good idea where we're trying to do? Do we have a cost-benefit analysis? Do we have all those kind of stuff to try to prove our point and to try to prove our hypothesis into the, the software development or the, the solution development. And, and when you, you take out DA and show with them that, you know, it's, it's, all about, it's all about meeting some of the goals and we might have other techniques than just following blindly the methodology that, uh, it, that has been used into our PMO. And this way we can together evolve some of the ways of working, evolve some of the practices and say, hey, you know what, were we able to pivot on, uh, you know, on a quick uh, time? Were we uh, able to, you know, uh, try to, to satisfy our, our stakeholders and, and it didn't work and then we have eight months to rework to do or not and all that kind of stuff. 
but really getting onto the goal-driven uh, uh, aspect of DA, which is really nice, kind of smooths a transition into a more agile ways of working into the PMOs. Yeah, and one of the things in HR that I would also recommend um, that I like to see at uh, uh, organizations, especially when they're kind of early on with seeing some success, is to have something that's like, a weekly agile clinic or you know sometimes it's you know office hours so that's one thing where you can start sharing some of the information having some of the people from the teams that have been seeing some success and, and not just focusing on the success have them focus on the challenge of what got them to that success right so that they're not sort of you know glossing over it's 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 a, you know not always easy to make um, these types of improvements and the other thing I would also recommend is, in, in, and I would say, you know, definitely balance this, is start to invite some of the people that have interest, especially from your PMO, to attend some of the iteration reviews, right? I mean, so again, preface that by saying, look, you know, there's, there's a purpose for these recurring events, and, and we don't want to take away from that, but so they can start observing how things are going and what is different. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do internally like that before you start getting into a lot of education, a lot of training or, or, you know, coming to webinars like this or whatever that in inside of an organization can, can really start to get the, the interest in the, the, the mindset changing a bit. I think one thing that I've observed if PMOs need to move away from having a microscope and managing work to orchestrating work and coordinating work across teams, especially in large organizations. And if you take a look at the program management goal diagram, you'll see the things that a, a PMO should be concerned about. Um, we call them decision points. Things like how do we coordinate the team's work? How do we coordinate schedules? Are we organizing our teams in the most effective way to minimize dependencies? So there's a lot of higher value work that they can do. And we mm -hmm. just help, have to help them understand what the opportunity is. Yeah. Our next question is from Kishani. She asks, what is the best approach to develop a roadmap for one team and for a team of teams? which is aligned to the organizational strategy taking into account of DA Toolkit? Well, there well, is not one best approach. Exactly. <laughs> First of all, there is no one fits all. Um, but yeah, then uh, I think you, you have to, to start where you are. You have to involve your, your team player. You have to involve the people in there into the designing of that roadmap. One of the mistakes I've seen in organization is a, a group of two or three people trying to do a roadmap on their side of the room and never talk to anyone and try to just, oh, let's see, uh, we have the roadmap now, so just execute it. So I think that's one of the common mistakes I'm seeing, but maybe you guys have some. Oh, that's, a, that's, that's just brilliant, Guillaume. Uh, yeah, I, I would, first of all, I'd like, I appreciate the question. Because so often when people start talking about agility, it's all about how do we make this group, you know, to, to talk about how Linda said, this group in the middle, how do we make them go faster? And that's not what Agile is about, right? Agile is about being resilient to change and always working on the most important, most valuable thing. And so roadmaps need to take that into account. So when we talk about how do you build these roadmaps out, whether it's for a single team or for a team of teams, um, it all begins way up at that front end there where Scrum is silent. We need to use some of the techniques inside a DA, we need to be involved in that. And we need to, and I, and I think Guillaume has kind of hinted at this, ensure that we are prepared to revisit that roadmap regularly. And the roadmap need not be, in fact, should not be overly detailed because it's going to change. And yeah. so we just, these are just, Mm -hmm. stakes in the sand to give us some direction. They're North Stars. They're in many ways aspirational. They are not concrete plans that we must now jam our efforts into. And that's, I think, a critical mistake that you see a lot of times. In terms of organizational alignment, I agree with you, Rod. We need something like a guiding North Star. Uh, sometimes it's called a vision or the guiding principles for the transformation. It's a list of the behaviors or the ways of working that we're trying to move away from and a, a vision for what we're trying to move towards. So for example, it might be moving away from uh, directing to moving towards coaching or moving away from forming teams around projects, moving towards bringing work to teams. So 
it's, it's that higher level vision or set of guiding principles that will help with the alignment across the organization. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then the balance of rather than see these frequently, I've, I've witnessed this, I'm sure we all have, where we have an initiative and it's enormous. And rather than think in terms of, so what could we do right now? Again, uh, kind of taking into account the Pareto principle, we might get 80% of our value from 20% of our effort. What would be the thing we're going to do that will really make a difference? And then take stock and do we continue on that particular initiative or do we switch to a different one because that one now delivers higher value? So it's constantly re-examining the value of what's being delivered. And it's not an easy thing. I mean, in a world, we would love the world to be deterministic and we could make a plan at the beginning of the year and just plan this roadmap all the way out and now we just work the plan. You know the old expression, plan the work and work the plan. The problem is, yeah, the plans cannot remain intact, right? No plan survives initial contact with the enemy. Uh, we know that, that's a great quote. I just love that. Um, so I, I think this is the kind of thing that we just have to be prepared or prepare our uh, ma senior management for is that these ideas of roadmaps are very much, as Paul says, they're visions, they're aspirational, they're, they're Norse, whatever you want to call them, but they need to be revisited over and over and over again. Just one point about the people affected by change. I think it's important that we invite them to come together and have conversations, perhaps in a lean coffee format to say, we've introduced this experiment into the organization, hopefully to improve our way of working. How's it going? What's your feedback? Are we on the right track? Or are there some minor adjustments that we need to make in order to improve our approach? So having those sessions and having leadership be part of those sessions, listening to what the people affected by change are saying is really important. Great. I have one more thing maybe to add about, about those roadmaps is, is sometimes people don't realize that until the product get out of the door, you cannot really convert any value. Mm -hmm. So, and, 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 even if you have the best plan ever, those are just hypotheses. And once those are not confirmed or not, you, know, you don't know. You don't know for, for real. So you need to get it out the door, take it to your customer, and, and try to do some guided condition improvement with that also. With the customer. Yeah, maybe, uh, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll uh, add one last thing, also just because Rod started with this, and keeping things very simple and lightweight and able to change things like, are we focusing on the things of highest value? Mm -hmm. are, are we working in small batches, right, so that we can deliver sooner? Because, Guillaume, you're right. I mean, until it gets out into the hands of our users, we don't really know. And the longer the, the delay to doing that, the longer time it takes, the bigger the, bigger the cost is. Um, and so, if you keep those on the metrics, you'll get lost in there, and and you say, "Oh, my teams just just delivered their their uh, their engagement, and even the the value is not getting out of the door." So yeah, well said. I I, I always harken back to uh, Don Reinertson, who talks about cost of delay. I'm a big fan of cost of delay. Don Reinertson says, if you want to quantify one thing, cost of delay. quantify cost of delay. So you <laughs> know, having a large initiative exactly as Guillaume said it takes a long time to realize any value could we be re could we be realizing value much earlier and in fact once that value is realized let's re-examine if we maybe we ought to switch to another initiative and realize the value out of that um, and so we're always doing an optimization of value being realized and again I, I I'm just piling on on what uh, all of you are saying I mean it's just so important to do that we have another question from Matha Vanin, and the question is, when the pandemic goes, hopefully it will, away from the world and when all businesses resume operations, they will not be sure about the context, whether to follow the old way or new normal or a mix of both the worlds. Agile can deal with medium complexity and uncertainty, but the situation after pandemic will be extreme uncertainty and complexity which is nothing but chaos. How should we prepare, how should we pre prepare for it um, from discipline agile point of view? Well, that's interesting because it, it sounds like um, our colleague there is 
making some references to perhaps the Kinevin framework, a way to understand uh, problems. And, you know, are there simple problems, complicated problems, complex problems, and then there's the chaotic problem space where apparently nothing works. There isn't any connection between um, action and results. Uh, you try something one time and something happens and you try the same thing again, hoping for the same results and it's something else. Um, that's kind of the chaotic space that we're that I feel like he's making some reference to. And uh, the, I'd invite people to look at the work of Dave Snowden. Uh, we certainly talk about the, the use of the Kinevin framework, but uh, I, what I would say is when you're caught in those sorts of spaces where you're moving towards chaos is the best thing you can do is to take a very small amount of work. Again, we're back to doing things in small batches and see what happens and continue to chart our way, right? Uh, you know, like no one in their right mind would run through a potentially hazardous area, whether whatever that might be. Uh, we would in fact walk through it slowly and take stock of, are we moving in the right direction? Do we need to change course? And that's, I, I think that Disciplined Agile gives us a lot of the tools. I don't know if it'd be all the tools, but nothing's perfect, but an awful lot of the tools we need to be able to do this kind of thing. And that's what we need to do. Um, uh, Again, and something flexible, not not just a one single path through a framework. Right. I, I mean, that's when we've we've got situations like this. We need to have lots of options that we can pick and choose from, yeah, and experiment I, with. Perfectly said, Joshua. I, you know, I, I would just say we have to. In many ways, this is a good thing in the sense to be in these kinds of turbulent times because we do need to move away from prediction and towards learning. We need to spend more time learning and less time predicting. I think that will stand us in good stead. I'd like to jump in as well, and, and, and not to be contrary to somebody who's asked a question, but I'm not convinced we're moving to chaos. I, I think we're in chaos, um, but I also think that agile is the way to um, avoid getting to chaos. I think if you start to uh, look at your processes now, you start to adopt doing smaller things and getting better value um, then and becoming more agile, then you'll be much, re much better prepared to adopt to whatever's coming next. And, and I think that's really the whole point of, of going with agile is uh, let's be prepared for the next wave. I mean, we know uh, two months ago, you probably couldn't have told that this wave was coming. But we know that the second wave's coming. It's not like this is going to be a big surprise. So we really need to be prepared for how do we change the way we're working and how does an enterprise address what do we need to do in the future? And basically, it's small pieces at a time. Let's get the biggest value out we can now. And let's make sure that as an organization, we start to focus on what's our best value over the shorter period of time. Planning a two-year project now, would be insane yeah. um, we, when we don't know where we're going. But looking at what do we need in the next month, what do we need in the next quarter, uh, it, it's certainly doable. Although even with the next quarter being the American election, even that is a little bit dubious. <laughs> uh, but still, uh, I think uh, like all of the things that we've said about uh, you know working towards doing things smaller and better and, and focusing on let's get the best value out, we'll avoid a lot of that chaos. It prepare us for uh, being able to adopt as things change. Uh, we're ne I, I would predict, even though Rod says you can't predict, I would predict we're never going back to normal. That normal's gone. It's just never going to happen again. <laughs> uh, but there will be a new normal, right? That, that we can uh, that we can adopt to and, and change to. And, and, on a, and on a positive note, I think, uh, a lot of organizations were, will come out better at, at the end of this only because they're, they're no longer looking two years, three years down the road, but they're looking at what can we do this month, next month, or, 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 or the next quarter. Well said. Um, I've got, there's one last question that I think I can answer very quickly since we are right at our time limit. Um, can we use scaling for discipline agile? Does program level lifecycle use for scaling? Yes, the name of the life cycle, which is the program life cycle, um, is the one that is for teams of teams. 
that is something that Glenn touched on in the very first webinar we did, which covered a lot of the information on the life cycles themselves. Uh, so that is one that you could go back and take a look at. And uh, any other questions that we have, we will write up, get out as a blog entry. I've got up on our screen, our next All Things Discipline Agile is gonna be on July 8th, where Giles Lindsay is going to talk about his experience with changing the mindset for shared service areas, marketing, enterprise architecture, security, privacy, um, people management, um, also known as, as HR. We are taking a break next week. So next week will be an off week for us, but we'll be back on July 8th. I would like to individually thank Rod and Guillaume and Linda and Paul and Glenn for attending today, as well as uh, all of you that are out, um, out in the audience. We really appreciate and appreciate all the questions. Any parting thoughts from any of our expert panelists? Well, just thank thanks you. for joining. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank always... you for taking the time to exactly. be with us. Thank you yeah. for taking the time. Yeah. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Bye. We'll see you on the next one.